All right, everyone. So it's just about 12.05 p.m. Pacific. I want to go ahead and get started. We've got a number of people here in the attendee list, and I'm already starting to see questions and comments and some great interactions on the poll. So I've already used at least four of my tricks for audience engagement before we've even started. So you'll see, um, we'll, we may be repeating some of these as well, but you've already gotten a, a taste of how I like to engage with virtual audiences. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got folks live on Facebook, on Instagram, and here on Zoom. And what we're covering today is virtual audience engagement, techniques for to help you learn how to present, listen, and connect remotely when you're communicating and sharing information, especially doing public speaking, when you are still at home, but presenting to a group of colleagues, coworkers, clients, customers, a variety of different audiences. We'll talk about those today. Also, just so you know, a recording of today will be shared um, afterwards. So feel free to share with as many people as you want. It'll, it's all publicly available, it's all free. This is a service that Oak and Reads is providing to our customers and hopefully potential customers to kind of get some information out there to help people deal with some of the uncertainties and the changes associated with remote work. And again, type your questions into the Q&A box throughout. We're gonna spend time answering those at the end. Otherwise, we're gonna get started. One small thing to note, we have a special guest today who you can see on the panelists. I will introduce her when we get to her portion at the end, but I'm really excited to have her along. She's an expert in public speaking and I don't wanna give away the secret yet. So you'll see at the end of this workshop, we're gonna have a special guest come in and share some of her expertise on public speaking and specifically around presenting to virtual groups. So let's jump right in. This workshop is sponsored by Oaken Reads. I'm the founder and CEO. And what we do here at Oaken Reads is interactive soft skill building. So typically our workshops are in person, but we've been doing virtual workshops for four years now. So we help people with communication and collaboration workshops. Uh, we help people with interviewing skills and a whole variety of communication and collaboration techniques. So again, if you're interested in bringing any of this content to your team specifically, please email me afterwards. I'll give you all the information. We work with a lot of different groups. So regardless of what industry you're in, what your role is, or where you are in the world, the techniques we're going to talk about today and the techniques we talk about on our workshops are useful if you have to meet with people, communicate clearly, work in a team. All of these things are critical skills, whether you're in the office or not. So here's what we're going to cover today. The first thing we're going to look at are some basic remote presentation techniques that are going to help you get comfortable and confident speaking to groups of all sizes. It's a little awkward when you're only seeing people through a computer or through a monitor. So we're going to talk about ways you can get over some of those weirdness, I would say, and also some of the awkwardness that is inherent in a virtual presentation. Uh, then we're going to talk about ways that you can become a better listener over video chat. In general, people these days in 2020 are, it's tough to be a great listener. It's even harder to listen when you are only interacting with someone through a computer, through the internet. There's so many distractions. We're gonna talk about what it means to be a good listener on video and through remote means and how you can practice some of those listening skills with yourself and with your team. So finally, we're gonna talk about a, um, an audience exercise that you can use for your virtual presentation. So Claire whoop, gave her away already. She's going to come in and she's going to walk us through an exercise that she uses with her clients to help improve your own virtual speaking abilities and continue to start a dialogue with your teams and your audiences about how you can make sure your message is resonating with your audience. So getting real-time feedback, that's something, a theme we're gonna come back to um, over and over again in this quick 30-minute webinar. I also wanna share our poll results. Let's go ahead and end the poll and let's see what we came up with. I'm gonna go ahead and share these out with the group so you can follow along with me. I'm really curious to hear how your virtual presentations are going. So question one, this week, did you give any virtual presentations? Looks like over half the group has. So this is clearly something that people are thinking about and working on. Um, for those of you who haven't, but are going too soon, well, this is useful for you. Um, I'm also curious, how long are your typical presentations? Seems like the bulk of them are around 30 minutes long, which is good. We'll talk about audience um, attention spans. And I would say beyond 30 minutes. That's why I cap mine at 30 minutes. You really start to lose people. If you're doing, luckily, it's good to see no one's doing two or three hour virtual presentations. 
I would say in general, those are really hard to do well. You're better off breaking those up into a couple different sessions and then giving people a chance to, to reconnect. Um, and let's see, what are some of the challenges? And you can select a bunch of them. It looks like the big winner is, not winner necessarily, but audience energy. So hopefully today that, um, so hopefully today, this will be an opportunity for you to think about how you can use engagement tools to make sure that you keep that audience energy up. So another thing that looks like is coming up is, you know, you don't know if the audience content is landing. That's what our last exercise is going to be about today is making sure that, you know, in real time, if you need to make adjustments, because maybe you may be losing your audience, right? So these are two common challenges. Looks like people are dealing with those right now. So happily, um, that's what we're going to talk about today. All right. So um, let's keep going. I want to jump in and let's talk about our first topic, which is remote presentation techniques. When it comes to pre presenting remotely, I think we have to acknowledge that we're faced with a humongous dilemma. And the dilemma is that we are trying to get people's attentions through the device and tool that is the number one distraction right now in the world, right? The internet is constantly trying to distract us, whether it's social media, whether it's the news, whether it's a pop-up from Slack or an email notification, everything that could possibly distract us is there and present on your audience's computers. And those are all the distractions that we need to fight against to make sure that we're keeping people engaged and we're making sure our message is landing. So we've got a tough challenge ahead of us, but I think it's worthwhile to acknowledge that up front um, because we're gonna have to battle those distractions in a different way than we would if we were meeting in person and we were there present physically with all of these audience members. So first things first, you gotta take care of yourself when you're presenting remotely. So some things you wanna do always, you still wanna use some of those presentation warm-up skills that you may have practiced when you're presenting in front of large groups. So always be focusing on your breath, right? You don't want to get shallow breath and you want to make sure you're breathing deeply from your diaphragm. Your breath is still your number one tool for making sure your voice is clear and loud and you're confident, right? If you're taking short, shallow breaths from your shoulders, if you're nervous, also typically this may happen if you're hunched over your computer sitting down. So I really like to recommend that you stand up. That's what I'm doing right now. Go ahead and just stack a bunch of books on top of your, um, underneath your computer. I like to use board games, it's one of my favorite board games, but I have three board games stacked under my laptop right now that allows me to stand up and almost create a, a mini standing desk. Make sure you're checking in with your posture. That's why standing is really helpful, right? You wanna make sure your feet are planted firmly on the ground. Even if you're sitting, you've got your core tight, right? So you're having good posture, you're sitting up straight and you're making sure you're standing. Almost imagine that the crown of your head, there's a little string pulling you up slightly just to make sure your spine is straight and narrow. Um, you wanna avoid letting your shoulders come up. If you're nervous, you wanna kind of pull those back make sure you're breathing deeply and your knees are bent if you are going to be standing, which again, I really highly recommend. So again, same body check-ins to replicate in-person speaking. That kind of reminds your body that you're speaking. You're not just chatting with a friend over Zoom. Another tricky thing about virtual presentation is where to look, right? So where to look is awkward because sometimes you may be on a call and you'll see someone looking up and to the left and it's not because they're not paying attention to you. It's that their camera is in one place and where your face is showing up is in another. So what I really like to do is try to make sure that your camera is where you're gonna be spending most of your time looking. So I'm really pointing at you right now so you can see this 3D effect. Um, I like to do that by, first of all, spreading out the audience into a gallery view. So we're on a webinar right now, you can't do that. But if you're on a Zoom meeting, you can click to gallery view so you can see everyone's face simultaneously. That's a great way to make sure you're paying attention to nonverbal reactions, head nods, smiles, laughter, especially if everyone's muted. You wanna be able to get that real-time connection. So get away from the normal speaker view and make sure you can see everyone simultaneously. It'll replicate that feeling of talking to an audience. And also you wanna go ahead and hide your own video feed if possible. It is a huge temptation to just stare at yourself while you're talking. So you want to go ahead and hide that because it'll allow you to focus back to your content. It's just a natural habit we have. It's like staring into a mirror. It's very, very enticing to just look at yourself the whole time and it's distracting. 
And finally, the really important one is get comfortable putting your slides or whatever materials you're going to be looking at as close to the camera location as possible. For me, what that means is I have my slides on my laptop, which is directly below me. And then everything else, you, the audience, the chat, the Q&A, that's above me. So most of the time I can just focus on the slides and that's very close to the camera. If I had a second monitor and my slides were all the way over here, I'd be going back and forth and it wouldn't look like I'm talking to you. So you're trying to replicate that feeling of making eye contact with the audience. And you do that by making your materials as close to the camera as possible to kind of replicate that feeling. So other things you wanna make sure of, you wanna have in your slides or whatever materials you're using to have reminders to check in with the audience. So you're gonna see throughout this workshop, I'm gonna have an on-screen reminder for a chat prompt or for a discussion prompt. So that makes sure that you remind yourself that some of these little built-in features that you've designed to make sure the audience stays engaged, that you don't skip over them. If you keep them in your notes, you might forget. So things like chat questions, things like polling, right? That's why I put in that previous slide, share the poll results right now. That's a reminder to me to share the poll results because you may forget, you may miss, right? You're focused on the content. And also I like to have conversation starters. That was those prompt questions that I had at the beginning of this webinar. You've got this critical time in the first five minutes of a virtual presentation when some people are showing up late, some people are showing up early. You don't wanna start without getting everyone there. So have something for people to do on their own so that people who are early start to get engaged and start to dig into the content. And you're not just building a bad habit of starting all your meetings five minutes late because you're gonna discourage the people who are on time from showing up on time in the future. So here's an instant application of what I'm talking about. Go ahead and type into the chat your answer right now. Just do a yes or a no, Y-N. Do you have engagement questions in your virtual presentations right now? Is this something you're doing? And, or if it's not, that's fine too. I just wanna hear some C's and Y's and some N's. All right, looks like this is new. Um, we've got Len, oh, hey Len. Um, we've got some Y's, we got some N's. Kind of an equal balance here. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so you see, all of a sudden that's a reason to get people engaged in reflecting and reacting just the same way that you might get head nods or head shakes in an in-person meeting. You wanna keep that back and forth, that two-way communication going. All right, not sure I give quizzes. Hey, Wendy, I'll count quizzes <laughs> as this as well. That's even better. Okay, the other thing I wanna talk about is how to keep your energy. So we talked about energy being a big challenge in our poll question. So. One of the things I always talk about in public speaking workshops is the four point of view questions. These are questions you can ask yourself before any presentation to make sure that your message and your content are going to be interesting to the group. So I always encourage people to ask themselves the question, why do I care, right? What's the thing about this content that gets me passionate so that I don't have to pretend to be excited. I actually allow myself to be excited about the thing I care about and let that shine through to the audience. The flip side of that is if you are bored with your content, I guarantee you the audience will be bored. And if you're bored and trying to engage an audience over virtual, it is 100% guaranteed that the audience will not come along with you. So for example, for today, I'm really passionate about public speaking. I'm gonna demonstrate some of the things, I'm gonna get excited about some of these things because I think public speaking is a really fun skill to learn. So I'm gonna remind myself of that. I just did before this presentation so that I allow my excitement to come through. Again, just because you can't see the audience doesn't mean they can't feel your excitement and your energy. So again, it's a little mental exercise, but it's a nice mental warm up that you can do before any virtual presentation. And also another thing with energy there can feel like this giant disconnect in reaction time to some of the things that you're saying and doing, especially if you're going to be building in interactivity activities <laughs> like chat questions, like polls, like unmuting people and asking for questions. There's going to be a delay. That delay is going to exist whether you're an expert or not. So you have to start to get comfortable with that little, you know, two to five second delay that will come as you're asking something, the audience is hearing it, they're thinking about it, and then they're interacting virtually. That delay doesn't exist when you're in person, right? If you ask a question to the group, you immediately see them, see them thinking, you immediately see them reacting. You don't have that luxury on a virtual call. So get comfortable, be patient, take a deep breath, 
as you wait what's really only five seconds or so for the reaction to come back but try not to panic and move on to your next slide while you're waiting for that feedback delay be confident that people are listening be confident that it'll work and that confidence will be rewarded with a really nice back and forth right so just just be aware of that so another thing oh i mentioned this already standing standing is huge that's good for posture it's good for breathing it's good for energy level standing overall when you're presenting is something i highly encourage just because we're at home doesn't mean we can't jerry-rig some way to get our laptops up by stacking books by stacking board games puzzles whatever it is so you elevate that camera and you can talk and use your physicality as you would as in a normal speaking environment all right things to think about with the audience right so I like to send ground rules before every virtual presentation. This is something I'm doing a lot recently. And these ground rules are because people's habits are all over the place when it comes to virtual meetings. So I like to encourage people, anytime they're showing up to a virtual workshop of mine, I want you to come prepared to turn your, your video on, come prepared to make sure your microphone works, but we're gonna mute everyone at the beginning, right? So that's kind of setting how we're gonna connect. And then I like to send a rule that says, I'm going to forbid multitasking. Now I can't control that, right? I can't control what's happening on your computer, but I really ask people to turn their notifications off. Some people didn't know that's an option, right? You can turn your slacks and email notifications off. So you're not disrupted and distracted. I want you to turn your phone to silent and turn it upside down on your desk. So you're not tempted by that text message or that news alert. And I really want to encourage you to turn all your other windows to minimum, right? So all you're looking at is the video screen and maybe any other materials that are related to that workshop or meeting. And the mindset I want you to encourage your teams and your audiences to have is if it's rude to do something when I'm talking to you in person, it's still rude to do that if we're on a virtual call. Right. So if someone pulls their phone out while I'm trying to talk to them and they're texting right in front of me, that's rude in a meeting. It's still rude if you do it on virtual, even if I can't see you. So again, that mindset is around giving the speaker your attention and making sure if they're giving you your, their attention, you have to promise them that it's going to be engaging. So it's a two way agreement there. Other great tools are polling, right? We just did a poll. I love Zoom polls. Uh, you have to have the webinar version to get them. But again, if you're presenting a lot, it's maybe worth the investment. It's another way to engage people throughout. If you don't want to buy that, there are lots of other live polling tools. One I really like is Mentimeter. And Athena is going to put that link in the chat. If you want to check it out, you can do it for free. You can have at least two or three questions for free if you want more than that. I think they start to charge you. But again, a really great way to get instant reaction and people can answer polls, they can chime in with questions, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do there. And I, again, I really like to use polls as people are entering meetings. It's an instant way to engage them. It doesn't have to happen all at the same time. And it's a nice piece of data that you can then get instant reaction to through a discussion or, or however you want to integrate that data or sharing it back. And also chat engagement. So I've already done one of these already. I find chat is really nice if you ask yes, no questions. It's an instant feedback for people. It makes sure that they're paying attention. It's a reminder that, hey, we have two sides to this conversation. And if you don't have polling features, it's a quick way to honestly make up your own poll in the middle of a talk. So build those reaction moments in and remember to put them in your slides so you don't forget to ask those questions. So your instant application. Type in the chat, have you watched Tiger King on Netflix yet? Give me a yes if you watched it, give me a no, and no spoilers yet, all right? So no spoilers in the chat, I would ask you. All right, we've got a lot of no's. Uh, no, but I heard it's great, and we're partway through. Okay, I just watched episode three, so I would say I'm partway through too. All right, we've got some yeses as well. So it looks like I'm seeing maybe 10% of people have seen it. So again, instant reaction, it's fun. You can add little things just to make sure people are paying attention. They don't have to exactly be on topic. Okay. So um, the final things I want to talk about with working with groups remotely are some other tools that are excellent for engagement. If you haven't experimented with Zoom breakout rooms, I highly encourage you to do that. My mindset when I'm talking to people about Zoom breakout rooms is that if you can do an activity or a type of conversation while seated in a conference room, you can do it in a Zoom breakout room. Because virtual meetings are really hard to have large group discussions, 
I encourage people, if you want to have a discussion with any more than four people, you either have to assign a moderator or a facilitator. And we covered that in webinar number two, when we talk about running virtual meetings, or if you want people to self facilitate, break them up into smaller groups of three or four. That's a reasonable sized conversation you can have in a virtual setting. And so what you can do is assign them discussion topics, break out into groups of three or four, come back together and share, right? It's much better than having a 10, 20 person full group discussion, way more efficient that way. And Zoom breakout rooms are really easy. You can just click the more button on a meeting, open up breakout rooms, assign people to those rooms. You can move people around. And as a moderator, you can jump into all those rooms as well in order to make sure people are doing well with their discussions. Keep it short, five minute discussion, and then bring everyone back. Um, yeah, great for two to four person conversations. And if you are going to do a longer meeting with breakout rooms, I highly encourage you to have a what I'll call a virtual workbook, some sort of shared document that people can access online so that when they're in those rooms, they have a list of what they're supposed to do because you won't be able to share your slides into those rooms. So again, just like having a handout at a meeting or sending the slides ahead of time, it's a way to make sure people can run things on their own when they can't see your slides highly encourage you to do that. So with all this stuff, it sounds a little pedantic and it sounds maybe a little over the top, but like I've been saying in all these weekly webinars, virtual communication requires a whole lot more structure and rules and planning ahead of time. I'm an improviser at heart, so a lot of those things great against me. I like to be able to work in the moment, think on my feet, but the virtual distance and the fact that technology is integral to it means you're a little less able to use some of those thinking on the fly techniques. So you got to plan a little bit more. The other mindset I have is this a third grade classroom, right? So don't be afraid in a virtual meeting to cold call on some people. And that's going to make sure people pay attention. And it's going to make sure that they know that they may have to participate. So they should be present. Don't do it in a mean way, but do it in a fun way to make sure that you're catching people. So also set expectations that if you need to leave early, you don't have to unmute and tell everyone and interrupt the meeting, right? Just like getting a bathroom hall pass in third grade. You don't have to interrupt the whole thing. Go sign out and go take the bathroom pass, right? Again, this has happened to me more than once. So again, just set the expectation. If you need to leave, type directly to the moderator, let them know you're going to come back and then do it. You don't have to raise your hand and interrupt the whole thing. It's not that big of a deal. But again, people mess this up. And so the other thing I like to say is there's a great feature on Zoom called attention tracking. So you can set this up on your own Zoom meetings. You go to in meeting advanced and then click attention tracking on. And what that does is it actually shows you whether or not people who are on your call have the Zoom window up as opposed to minimized. So what that is, is a way for you to kind of sneak onto their computers to see, is this person paying attention or are they multitasking? So I, an instant application of that would be for me to publicly shame the people who have this meeting uh, minimized on their computer because I can see it on the panelist list. I'm not going to do that because I'm <laughs> trying not to alienate my potential customers, um, but it is kind of a fun thing you can do because all of a sudden the person will realize, oh, I'm going to be in this meeting. And you, it's almost like you're that third grade teacher with eyes in the back of your head. It's a fun little feeling of power. Don't abuse it. Okay. So those are all remote presentation techniques that I think are very helpful. Again, this will be available online, so you can go back and review those. We're moving pretty quickly right now. So next, I want to talk about listening skills. Listening is very difficult on a virtual call. And so there's some things I want to remind us of what it means to be a good listener, especially when we're virtual, and an exercise you can run with your teams to practice and reflect on some of our listening abilities. So. We want to make sure that we're doing a good job of deep listening while we are inundated with all the distractions that are inherent in a virtual meeting or a virtual call. So what can we do? So what are these behaviors we want to remind ourselves to do? Again, it's worthwhile to check in with yourself anytime you're about to do or listen for a long time. You're taking action to promote these behaviors both in yourself and your teammates. So what does it look like when someone's actively listening? Being present. Right? On a virtual call, that means actually looking at the person. Right? That means giving them um, physical reactions like head nods and smiles and understanding that they can see you back and providing that nonverbal reaction to make sure that you are encouraging them to keep sharing. 
right? That also means don't mute your video and lie down in your bed because the physical feeling of lying down in your bed and relaxing is not, is going to give your body the mistaken idea that we're not fully present. So, you know, be sit up, sit straight, look into the computer. All those physicalities will, will remind you to be mentally and physically present. Also, one thing I always like to talk about on virtual calls is this idea of verbalizing the nonverbal, especially if people are muted or if it's a phone call. Don't be afraid to actually say out loud the physical reactions that you're having, right? Saying things out loud, like I'm nodding to that, that makes a ton of sense. Or it looks like I'm, I'm shaking my head to that, I don't believe it. Or I'm feeling a little bit unclear about that. You know, saying out loud the things that would be so obvious with your body language if you were meeting in person, sometimes people will miss those body language reactions. So don't be afraid to say out loud loud. It sounds a little weird, but it actually works really well because oftentimes we think naturally that our facial expression is going to indicate to the presenter that you disagree or agree, but they may miss it because you're just a little box on their screen. So unmute yourself, say it out loud, and have that conversation with someone. If you're in a meeting, track your timing. You can't be a good listener if you're dominating the conversation and speaking, you know, 80% of the meeting, right? So tone it back. I like to talk about this idea of step up or step back, where if you're a person who's a little quieter, make sure you step up and take the reins and take control and speak up. And if you're a person that tends to dominate conversations in person, it's even more likely that you're going to dominate conversations on virtual meetings. So step back a little bit, hold yourself accountable to not take over the meeting because it's very hard. It's even harder for quieter, more introverted people to interrupt on a call. Um, so you may be taking all the oxygen out of the air. So keep a balance there. Encourage, acknowledge, and validate. This is even more important on video. As you're listening, give them an uh-huh. Give them a, yep, that makes sense. Keep going, right? Make sure you understand. Yep, I agree with you. Keep going. Or I understand. Let's move on, right? Giving them these real-time reactions. Because if you're just a blank face and you're not nodding along, they may not have any idea if you're paying attention or you're staring at something different on the screen, right? So there's, there's all these distractions that again, if you're not giving them audio, audio reactions, they may assume that you're not listening. Asking open-ended questions is something you're saying, but it's still a good listening behavior. So it's inviting the audience or inviting the speaker to share more information, information they feel matters most. Asking closed questions, often sort of yes, no, clarifying questions can be useful. But great listeners want to keep inviting speakers to keep sharing open-ended questions like, hey, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Or what do I need to know? What are the most important things about this topic? Again, allow people to reinforce whatever message they're sharing. Don't be afraid to empathize, right? This is even more important now that we're in a stressful environment in a stressful time, reacting and validating feelings, saying I'm feeling the same thing or saying I understand where you're coming from. Again, a lot of those Typically, those empathetic movements and gestures happen non-verbally. You may have to verbalize those a little bit more aggressively than you're used to, just to make sure that the message of empathy is coming across the screen, because a lot can be lost over, over digital communication. And finally, great listeners cut people off sometimes to summarize and paraphrase to reflect back. So what that means is you say, okay, let me pause for a moment and share back what I'm hearing, just to make sure I got it right. And that's really critical. It's critical to listen in short bursts when you're online because your attention span is a whole lot shorter, right? So chopping up this conversation and making sure you're reflecting back periodically to ensure you're getting the information correct is going to, again, make sure that you walk away from whatever conversation having heard the right messages. Don't just let them talk for 10 minutes and expect that you're gonna get it all right. Break that up into two to three minute chunks, redirect the conversation. It's gonna help you as a listener. So an exercise I really like to run with my clients, whether we're in person or whether we're virtual, is this exercise called two minute reflection. This is a listening practice exercise. And this is a great exercise for you to do in a Zoom breakout room. Just assign people partners and send them off to go into these breakout rooms to run this exercise on their own. It's a way to practice our listening skills and build our listening muscles. So you assign them to a room, you tell them, hey, pick one person to be A, one person to be B. You can randomize it in a fun way if you want, right? A is in the earlier time zone, B is in the later time zone. 
whoever has their birthday closest to today, who cares? And then what you do is instruct them to keep a timer. So for two minutes, A is gonna talk about a recent challenge they've overcome, right? Partner B keeps track of time. And then B is just gonna listen to them talk about that challenge for two minutes. They're not gonna interrupt. They're not gonna ask questions. They're not gonna chime in with what they think they would do, right? They're just gonna ask, they're just gonna listen. And then after two minutes, it's then B's turn to reflect back and share out what they heard. So this is their opportunity to use that reflection skill. And so what they're instructed to do is share back using these categories. Share back a quick summary of what's going on with that challenge. Share back what they understand to be the most important part of that challenge. Again, using your listening skill to filter and sort of contextualize what they're talking about. And then if you can, challenge people to go a level deeper with their listening. See if they can reflect back how their partner's approach to this challenge reflects their values, reflects their team values, their personal values, company values. And again, it's a, a, a chance to kind of go a level deeper with listening and see if someone can talk about a challenge, but in the reflection, share back some deep underlying meaning, which again, allows people to build more connection and build more empathy. They may not get there, but again, this is an opportunity to fold this in with some of the team values discussions that we discussed on webinar three as a way to reinforce some of the values behaviors that we're really looking to see when we are virtual and we can't see each other in person anymore. So it kind of folds in with that, that discussion that you may have had with your teams last week. And then you switch. Partner B shares a challenge, A listens, and then A reflects back those topics. So you can kind of see, it's a really quick exercise eight minutes of sharing, you know, a lot, let's say 15 minutes for the whole exercise in total. And what's cool is you can have a debrief when you bring people back and ask them, what did they notice, right? Did they find themselves, their minds wandering to going to solutions instead of just listening? Did, were they able to pay attention for two minutes? What made it easier? What made it harder? Um, and how accurate were they in their reflections? It's a really good conversation starter if you want to have a group discussion on listening skills. And again, we won't do that right now, but Take this with you, run it with your teams. This works really well virtually, and it's a good segue into a larger conversation about either values or communication expectations for your virtual meetings. All right, so I'm very excited for our final portion here. We are going to introduce our guest speaker today. So as our first guest speaker on Work From Home Wednesdays, and she's phenomenal. So our guest today is going to be talking about presentation engagement ideas. So a technique and an exercise you can use on your own. Her name is Claire Slattery. She is a phenomenal public speaking coach, facilitator, performer. She's a great improviser and comedian. I've worked with her a number of times with clients, both in person and virtually. And what she's great at is giving you really clear, concise feedback and techniques to improve your speaking and communication skills. So I'm really excited to introduce Claire. And Claire, welcome to the call. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I do look like my headshot, hopefully at least closely enough. Uh, thanks for having me on. As Dave said, this is a highly virtual time that we find ourselves in. And uh, in that virtual space and spaces that we find ourselves in, we have the opportunity to really get people engaged. But something that I want us to kind of have a, a source perspective from is I really believe in the fact that if we want to get engagement from the audiences that are listening to our virtual presentations, we have to engage them. We have to really show them and guide them, just like Dave was saying, uh, with a little more structure, a little more instructions, a little more of these kind of cultural and communication norms so people know how to participate. Uh, because uh, deep down, a lot of us really want to get it right or really know how to contribute and be great collaborators. So I think we come from that place of empathy of really acknowledging like people want to know how to show up for us so let's try to see how we can let them know that so today uh we had the opportunity uh dave and i to collaborate and we thought well let's let's do an exercise with everybody and this is just essentially a presentation prompt idea a way to really let people know um how they can engage when you're presenting virtually so we're going to give it a try the animation then <laughs> <laughs> Yay, animations. <laughs> <laughs> so
So wonderful. So like I mentioned before, right, presenting virtually, the big question is engagement. Just like we did at that poll at the top, right? It's how do we know our information's landing? How do we keep the energy both up as a presenter ourselves, but also for the audience? How do we really keep them focused and listening? So how do we engage so we get engagement? That's the big thing. You have the content, maybe it's a talk you've given live before, now you're being asked to give it virtually. Maybe it's a sales pitch, internal, external, whatever it is, however big or small or long that talk is, you really wanna know how you can get people interacting with your content. So to that end, we wanna really help our audience know how to listen, right? We want them to know how to participate, and particularly one of the things that I really, really uh, deal with a lot in the coaching work that I do, both virtually coaching and in-person coaching, is really answering the question for participants and people who are your audience as to why they, both individually or collectively, why are they on this call, right? People really want to know their role. So really let them know hey, I gathered us today for this reason, or by the end of this call, I really want all of us to have chimed in and get a real temperature check on how we're feeling about X project or presentation coming up or an event we're coordinating, right? These can be really great leadership moments. And just as Dave's been demonstrating this whole time, we can really find small ways that don't detract or uh, get us off course from the presentation of the meeting we're trying to run. Instead, they can actually make it all the more important and relevant to the people who are on the call. So those are the kind of parts of, of that engagement process. So this is an exercise. Again, we're gonna, we're gonna show you and then we're gonna have you uh, actually do it on your own in a moment. So for this, this is all about giving the audience, your audience, whether it's two people, 200 people, uh, a prompt so that they know how to listen. So here's how I have uh, coached individuals to do it. So if I were the presenter, as I am right now, I would ask my audience to pull out a pen and paper. Actually, I think maybe one of the questions in the chat or the Q&A section actually already came up around this. Like, what if someone's taking notes online or in another window, right? I would ask to for people to remember how to use their hands to write things down, <laughs> Pull out a pen and paper. It could be a post-it, it could be a notebook, whatever. And ask them to listen for two things and write those two things down on their paper. So um, you will say, hey, over the course of my presentation, I want you to listen for these two things. Go ahead and write them down on your piece of paper so that you have them written down and then you can jot down notes, thoughts, doodles throughout the presentation that I give under those two things that I want them to keep an eye out for, right? So again, I'm really making clear what I want them to listen for. I'm asking for their perspective and saying, hey, there'll be an opportunity at the end to gain your information, that, that feedback live and have you collaborate as a part of this. So we'll encourage people to jot down the notes. Before we get to the end of the presentation, something that I really like to do and that Dave has been displaying as well is doing a temperature check, right? So say my presentation, like many people's are, are 30 minutes, right? About 15 minutes through, you have your, your timer, you're kind of keeping track of time as a presenter. Use the chat function or depending on the size or uh, type of, of participation your group likes to have, use the chat function or have people voice like a one word response or maybe one of the thoughts or doodles they've jotted down so far. That way, depending on your comfort level, you can use some of that uh, temperature check information to guide the second part of your talk or say, hey, it actually feels like we're all really concerned with this. Let me address that, right? So again, using listening as an as a feedback tool and an op opportunity for true engagement where people can say, hey, this is what I'm interested in. And you can really use it as an opportunity to serve, connect, and empathize. And Claire, I'll just jump in there. Another way you can do this is with a tool called Fist of Five, which some people may be familiar with for like agile work, where you can just ask people, give me, show me on your hand, right? Open your video on a scale of one to five, how am I doing? Or on a scale of one to five, how well is this presentation going? People will show you on their fingers. You can get an instant read on how things are going. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, video prompts 
especially are great too. I'm a, I'm a big fan, obviously not in the, in the webinar format, but in a, a virtual presentation format. Again, like the gallery view Dave was talking about. I love being able to see faces, get all of that nonverbal communication cues and feedback. So you could do even things like this or, you know, hearts, right? Anything, right? These are kind of the, the visual languages you get to figure out how you want to keep that engagement and energy up. Uh, the last part of it, that prompt at the beginning of your presentation, is just telling your audience, hey, we'll share these responses at the end of the presentation. So kind of a little bit like that third grade mentality that uh, Dave was talking about, right? Like, let them know, hey, I'm going to be calling on you, right? Not to like catch them, but to say, hey, I want to hear your voice and this is the role you're playing. And this is an expectation I'm setting for you as the listener so we can create something here today. So again, chat function are unmuting that person so they can speak it aloud. So I know that's a little bit of a, a lengthy introduction, but it goes much faster once you just tell the audience. So we're gonna have you try it in a moment, but first I wanted to actually do it with Dave. So Dave, are you ready for a little, a little try? I'm, I'm ready, my, my window is up, but I haven't minimized you. <laughs> oh good, if I were checking, well done. Yeah. So. So Dave obviously presents all the time. He's given these webinars. He does it with Oak and Reads. I've collaborated and seen Dave give presentations. So Dave, take one example of a pre presentation topic that maybe you're going to give this year or have given. What, what would that be on? Yeah, so I'm actually doing one tomorrow. Uh, I'm doing a virtual workshop on change management and how to lead your teams through change which is obviously very, very applicable right now. So I'm yeah. working with a virtual group in New York tomorrow. So I'm waking up nice and early. We got a, a 9 a.m. Eastern start. So the two questions, I want to make sure that they understand and can provide feedback halfway through. The number one thing is, do you understand how to apply this change management tool to your team? And if they're not understanding that halfway through, I need to stop and make sure I answer questions, right? Because the, the workshop will be a failure if they don't understand applications. And then two, the question I wanna make sure people walk away with is, do you know when you're gonna apply these things? So talking about accountability, right? I really want them to share with me, um, not only do they understand how to do it, but when are they gonna do it to make sure that this isn't something they're just saying, you know, hypothetically, they actually know in my team meeting on Friday, we're gonna spend 30 minutes doing this exercise. That's what I want them to be able to share back with me. Awesome. So great, so it not only helps you, like what I'm hearing from you is like, it not only helps you as a facilitator and a teacher to really make sure that the information and the presentation is landing with your audience and you can adjust accordingly, but also you're giving people that direct applicability and way to integrate the learning and say, hey, I want you to write these things down so that by the end of this presentation, by the end of this training, you know how to take away this learning, right? So again, it's giving them that sense of agency and participatory learning to make sure that they really, that's why you're asking that of them. That's awesome. And, and I think with this, especially with virtual, you need to make the audience take ownership over yeah. the content, right? Because it can very easily become a, a one-way conversation where you're asking a lot of them, but if you're not understanding how they get something out of this conversation, you're sort of failing as a, as a meeting leader that way. Great. Right. Well, thanks for doing that example with me. Yeah. Uh, I would love now, everybody who's joined uh, the webinar, I would love for you to do this on your end. So take 30 seconds if you have a pen and paper with you, uh, or uh, you can just think in your mind, what's a presentation topic? Maybe you're giving tomorrow like Dave, uh, or you've given this week, or we'll give next week. And just think about kind of just as Dave displayed, kind of generally what that topic might be. And then take about a minute or two right now and jot down those one or two questions of how, what you might prompt your audience to listen for, or how you might want them to, to provide you feedback or direction or, um, or guidance at the end. So go ahead and do that. And then when you're done, if you have a question, uh, one or two done, then we're gonna put those in the chat function and just take a little bit of a review. Uh, and as we're doing in this kind of meta participatory way, 
then we will have some examples of some listening prompts. And that can be a nice way for us to borrow and steal from each other. Because yeah. regardless of topic, there might be another type of prompt or question that someone else puts down that could be really relevant for something you're doing next week or tomorrow. So go ahead and take a, a moment and do that. Yeah. All right, we've already, we're already starting to see some. This is excellent. So Stephanie, yeah. Betsy, gold medals for being first there. Eight so plus. <laughs> yeah, super fast, which is great. So yeah, do you understand how to apply the mindset framework, how you can implement this in your daily work life? What is happiness and where does it come from? And what is joy and where does it come from? Rhonda, I want to go to that talk. <laughs> Just invite me if it's possible. These are great questions. Again, these can be specific to the content or can be larger questions that are around the theme. Both are really useful. Mm -hmm. All right. So while people are taking their time to think about what those prompt questions are, I think we're going to multitask a little bit right now and move ahead to Q&A. So keep sharing those in the chat. Again, this is to kind of both help you practice and help you share because people may borrow some of these ideas and obviously credit, credit them. But um, mm -hmm. I think it's really useful to see what kind of presentation prompts are useful for other folks because we can all learn from each other on these types of calls. So again, if you need to run, great to see you here today. Quick reminders before we get into Q&A. We're going to post this video online on social media and on the Oak and Reads website. So please invite anyone who's interested to go and view this recording or any of the previous recordings. They're all available, all free, all online. And if you want to learn more about remote working, we're constantly updating the Oak and Reads website, oakandreads.com slash remote work. And Athena will put that into the chat. Tons of FAQs and information and other things beyond these webinars that you can hopefully use to help your teams work better, more efficiently, and stay happy while you're stuck at home. And finally, uh, please sign up for next week's webinar. Um, we are going to put that in the chat. It's going to be available. You're going to get an email about that later today as part of the um, reminder about the recording. So sign up for that. We're going to do another one next week. And I, again, it's right there in the chat. Go ahead and do that. We're going to figure out what we're going to talk about on Friday. All right. So let me know if you've got a topic because I'm doing these on the fly. We're going to figure it out in real time. So let's go ahead and answer some of these questions. Um, Michelle was first where she's talking about, I do virtual sales presentations to schools and haven't been do doing too many because schools are closed. And we use Ring Central for our meetings, which could be one-on-one -on -one or a group. They're doing good, but always looking for new tips and tricks. So I think Ring Central is, I'm not sure if it has video functionality, but I would say you can still do a lot of this type of real-time reactions if you add something to the meeting invite. By that, I mean, I mentioned earlier, have a virtual workbook. Maybe have a virtual document like a Google Doc open where you can have people participate, ask questions, almost like creating your own chat feature, which again adds more abilities for people to react in ways other than one person talking to the whole group, right? So I think it's useful to have some secondary things happening um, just to add another way for people to interact with you on the call. I don't know, Claire, if you have any thoughts there for interaction on just phone, phone calls or, or group phone calls. Yeah, I think something you said earlier, Dave, really resonated with me is those moments of pause or silence or transition, especially on calls when we can't see each other visually, can feel like eons of time. So I think getting comfortable with some of those transitions or pauses, uh, and I think, again, that, that thing about structure, even if it's a phone call, right, G having a moderator, having someone really guide the conversation and offer moments for reflection in different modalities, right? So even if we're only on a phone call, say, hey, for this call, I would like for you to have a whiteboard in front of you or a pen and paper, or I'm going to ask you to doodle something, right? So still engaging the senses and still um, using visual elements to learn would be really something that I would recommend, even if it's just voice that you're um, uh, collaborating on. Yeah, I love that. Um, we have our next question, uh, Janina. It's not really a question, but talking about tech issues. So I'll call it a question or a comment, call it a comment. This is, you know, there's sometimes there's issue playing music in the background. So yeah, make sure to mute whatever music or other background sounds you have going on. And also I have a thought, just because it's April Fools, a trick that's been played on me multiple times is if you are talking to someone and you know they have a smart speaker or smart home, you can say something like, okay, Google, turn on the music. <laughs> 
and it'll turn on the music in their <laughs> apartment um, through your video chat. So it is April Fool's, so I got to give you some way to play pranks on people. You uh, trick her. Remotely. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, now I've done my own trick to myself <laughs> here. Okay, Google, pause. Don't, no, you don't play it on me, Claire. Um, okay, so we have a question from Franz. Um, how do you use gallery view with 30 plus participants? Great question, Franz. Also, Franz, hello, from Germany. And um, so with 30 plus, the problem there is you, I think you have to click um, next page. So you can't view more than 30 simultaneously because they get to be tiny little thumbnails. So you have to, at that point, click from page to page, which is a little annoying. Um, I also think if you're doing gallery view, if you're doing workshops, and I've talked with Franz earlier, he's teaching classes, engineering classes in Germany, and um, you will probably be helped by having someone online with you who's sort of a facilitator person. I have my, my assistant Athena on right now for that same purpose. She's managing the chat, she's managing the Q&A, she's answering questions. So because you can't get real time visual feedback from everyone, I would recommend having someone there to be like production support, basically. I know Claire, do you have thoughts on that? No, I'm just support what you say. Yeah, it can always help much like uh, I really love and have co-facilitated with Dave in the past. It's just when, when possible, it's a great way to collaborate, right? So even if it's a colleague who you wanna uh, co-run or co-facilitate or co-host a virtual meeting with, it just helps to have that kind of support, uh, whether it's an assistant or not, someone who can be answering some of the questions as someone else is leading and talking to the slides. So again, uh, these are opportunities also to make things feel more collaborative and interactive too. Like we have the opportunity to, to take a colleague and say, hey, run this meeting with me. So that's an opportunity too to get that support. Yeah, and Franz has a follow-up around this video causing problems in the data traffic. I know I've seen some messages from Zoom that they're gonna start throttling some of the videos for larger groups. So I can't exactly speak to that. I'm sure that's kind of changing day to day, but I haven't had trouble having more videos on a call. Um, but again, Franz, let's chat later. <laughs> so we can, I can walk you through some of this stuff. Phil, great to see you, Phil. Question from Phil, how do you share the virtual workbook with breakout room participants. So the what I've been doing, and again, you may have a better solution. I just create a Google Doc and then I set it to be viewable by anyone with the link. And then I just post that Google Doc link in the chat. So if someone missed the email before, they can log on right then and there so long as they have a Google account. Um, there's no kind of permissions there. That's the simplest. I try to make it easy. And so everyone can see it. And then, you know, they can take notes and do exercises on their own computer, but at least they see the instructions, instructions there. Um, Phil has a follow-up. How can we deal effectively with participants who are taking notes on their computer while listening? I.e., should we work harder to engage them somehow? I don't know, Claire, you want to take that one first? Yeah, I think, I think this was the one I kind of shouted out to a little bit earlier. Um, I think, again, coming from a place of empathy and compassion, right? Some people are like, my handwriting is abysmal. I can't even read it myself. So I have to take notes on my computer. I think allowing and coming from a place of trust too, of saying, hey, if that's the way the person can listen best and they're gonna take notes and they have a different window open for notes, okay. I think it's always great to even use the poll or chat function at the top to just say, like, hey, how do people, you know, feel about uh, taking notes? Or does one person want to take notes and share out, right? Or uh, me as a presenter or a meeting leader, I might say, hey, if people are simultaneously taking notes, I'm going to build in a minute reflection time one or two times throughout the presentation for people to like review their notes or take a pause to reflect and not take a note for a minute, right? So again, building in some of that um, cadence and structure and guidance so that people can maintain their energy, stay connected. So those are some ideas that come to mind. Yeah, I, I love those. And, and something I think is just always helpful is take a break. You yeah. know, what would be, it's awkward to take a break in the middle of, you know, a 30 minute meeting in person, but because we're all at home anyway, if you say, hey, you know, what, halfway through, let's take a three minute break and mute our videos, do what you need to do and come back for the last 15 minutes. That's easy, right? So that people can catch up you can build those breaks in as email breaks or Slack breaks, right? So again, thinking about listening in very short, short bursts, 
being realistic that someone probably can't be off Slack for 15 minutes, which is tough, right? But if that's the case for your team, make everything 15 minute modules and take a five minute break, right? That way, again, it's a two way agreement with the speaker and the audience. You take care of me, I'm gonna take care of you so that when we are interacting, we're all fully present. Um, it's one idea there. All right, so Margaret has a question. Is there a way to combine a presentation and a meeting on Zoom? I think yes. I, if I'm hearing your question right, I mean, kind of like what I'm doing now, you can share your screen on Zoom and that way everyone can see your slides like we're doing on this call. Um, you can share your video, obviously, like we're doing here too. And you can also collaborate with some tools like a, a virtual whiteboard, which I don't use a lot. I find it a little clunky, but that's an option too if you want to have multiple people drawing on something together. Um, I don't know, Claire, do you have any other thoughts there on combining presentations in Zoom? I think. Yeah, I think, I think like Dave said, you can have a meeting and then share your slides and um, there are different, there's some great Zoom tutorial videos out there that show you how to share slides. But one thing I really like about the Zoom uh, software in particular is that um, whether it distracts you or not, it can be nice. You can see, like I can see the other participants, like I can see Dave and Athena as I'm giving uh, a talk, right? So if these were my slides, I could connect to my content just like Dave has been doing and still have um, a way to connect and visually see the people in the meeting. So it's a nice way to actually give a presentation and be able to see people. So yeah, I'd say check out some of those videos and um, yeah, you can absolutely present in a meeting format. Yeah, yeah. And another question from Franz. I love Franz. Full of questions. I love it. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm having to remotely conduct six hours a week for 15 weeks in lectures. Is there any experience doing that? Yeah, I think Franz, you know, we'll, we'll chat afterwards too, but I also think one thing that's a larger idea, and I was talking with another colleague yesterday about this, you know, he does full day workshops, right? Eight hour workshops in person. Let's step back and remind ourselves that virtual meetings can be really frustrating and annoying, but it also frees us of a lot of the logistical requirements for normal meetings that we no longer have to worry about. So for example, if you're doing like a long two to three hour lecture, typically if you're doing that in person, the logistics require everyone to come there at a set time and all sit down and all be there for three hours. But now that we're virtual, why not break up that three hour lecture into three one hour lectures on different days or different moments throughout the day, right? Why not break up that full day workshop that has to be eight hours into two weeks of 90 minute sessions? because there's no travel requirements and you don't have to book a conference room, right? Remember, remember being frustrated by not being able to find a conference room, right? That's out the window now. We've always got whatever conference room we want. So think about being a little creative there. It doesn't, all of those requirements that existed before, a lot of those are completely non-existent now. And we kind of have to free ourselves and think a little creatively about breaking things up, taking breaks, meeting at weird hours, all of it is on the table right now. Um, that looks like it for questions. Um, oh, right, one, one last one from Rhonda. Um, I'm working in the free version of Zoom. I think chat's the only engagement option I have right now. Any other suggestions? I think you, correct me if I'm wrong, Claire, I think you have to have pro to do breakout rooms. Is that, is that right? Yeah, you have to have a paid version to do breakout rooms, but it's worth it. I think it's worth it. I, I think like just yeah. it, how much a month. Um, it, so I would say it's worth springing for the 15 bucks a month right now, just because it's going to make your life that much easier. Think of what we're not spending that money on. Again, not to know your budget, but I think as far as tools go, making sure you've got all the bells and whistles on Zoom is really going to save you a lot of frustration and a lot of headaches, you know, in the coming weeks, months, hopefully not <laughs> too much longer than that. All right. I don't know. Any last thoughts, Claire? It looks like we've answered all the questions. No, these were great questions. I've been, I've been checking out the, um, the prompt questions folks have been putting in the chat and they look fantastic. Um, yeah. And it, and it can, again, they can be uh, very practical questions. They can be questions to help people get their creativity going. Um, so again, you get to guide as a presenter how you want people to listen. So it really could be like, you know, do, uh, you know, two things I want you to listen for. One, how does the tone of my voice change throughout the presentation, right? 
and it could be the second thing, what words are coming up mm -hmm. to you as I give this presentation, right? So it can be as minimal of the kind of feedback you want to as, um, you know, heady, intellectual, fully fleshed ideas, right? So again, I, I just wanna encourage everybody to think about that type of spectrum too, right? How simple or how uh, involved the questions are, right? Because again, you still wanna present and you still want people to focus on your content. So uh, do, do think about that when you're we're thinking about some of those prompt questions. Cool. And so we're gonna close out right now. Again, Claire, thank you so much for coming today, sharing your expertise. If you are interested in bringing some of this content around training, around group workshops to your team, please reach out to me, Dave at oakenreads.com. Um, we're doing all these virtual workshops all the time, honestly. It's been really <laughs> busy recently. And also, Claire, how can people get in contact with you if they'd like some one-on-one -on -one coaching um, on some of these speaking techniques? Yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks, Dave, uh, for having me on here. This is stuff that I'm working on right now. I do a lot of one on one virtual coaching. I've been working with folks for the past six plus years doing virtual coaching. So meeting on Zoom or Google Hangouts or, or many other platforms, uh, WhatsApp, Skype, all the things um, and working with people globally to help them, especially right now as meetings their leadership, their team collaboration, and particularly their talks are going virtually. So uh, if you're interested, please reach out to me. Athena will put my contact information um, in the chat, but I'm Claire uh, Slattery, and it's Slattery at gmail.com. And one thing that I'm offering to everybody here today is uh, a free one hour intro coaching slot with me. So I have a scheduling link that Athena, thank you, Athena, will also put in the chat. So please, please hit me up. <laughs> really, uh, sincerely and genuinely. It is a strange time. I, I'm getting a lot of inquiries right now of people saying, hey, my keynote that I was going to give at this conference is now virtual. I've never given a virtual keynote. Or I'm having to give a big internal presentation at my work and everybody's spread out all over the globe. How do I do this, right? So now is the time to really try to look at some of the tools and techniques you want and need to show up virtually. We got some amazing, amazing help from Dave today. So if you want some of that more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, customized look at where you're at and where you want to be, please hit me up. Um, and you can just go directly to the Calendly link in the chat, sign yourself up. I would love to work with you. Awesome. Yeah, Claire's phenomenal at this. So take her up on that. A free one hour coaching you can get a lot done in an hour working with Claire on public speaking. I can fully attest to that. So we're going to wrap it up right now. Um, you got all the info. More to come next week. Let me know. I've already seen some suggestions in the chat. So thank you, Lindsay, for that. And we will be back here next week at noon on Wednesday for another edition of Work From Home Wednesday. So Claire, thanks for coming. Have a good day, everyone out there. Stay safe and enjoy your presenting. <laughs> Bye, everybody.